Hey, welcome, uh, folks. It is my pleasure to introduce today's plenary session chair. I can't think of a better officer, leader, and acquisition professional than Brigadier General Mike Sloan to facilitate discussions on Army acquisition modernization efforts. He is currently the program executive officer for intelligence, electronic warfare, and sensors. He previously served as the program executive officer for simulation training and instrumentation. Prior to that, he was the assistant PEO of enterprise information systems, the chief of staff to the assistant secretary of the army acquisition logistics and technology, project manager for soldier sensors and lasers and product manager for soldier clothing and individual equipment at PEO soldiers. And finally, as assistant product manager for the missile defense agencies Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, Project uh, Office. Brigadier General Sloan brings a unique perspective, having served for over two decades as a leader in five different PEOs and acquisition organizations on some of the Army's highest priority acquisition efforts supporting our warfighters. General Sloan, welcome, and we look forward to your panel chair remarks and introduction of our esteemed panelists today. Over to you, General Sloan. Hey, thanks, Dr. Morlock. Always great to see you and our distinguished panel members. Um, so good morning to, to our audience. Thanks for joining us today uh, at the 18th Annual Acquisition Research Symposium. It's hosted by the Acquisition Research Program at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. Uh, welcome to uh, plenary panel number eight, Acquisition Modernization. So today we're going to talk a little bit about creating synergy for informed change. We have distinguished leaders from the Army Futures Command, Industry, and the Army Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office. All right, so if we go to the next chart, please. So what I'd like to do is just briefly introduce my organization. It's the um, Program and Executive Office for Intelligence, Electronic Warfare, and Sensors. It's uh, at Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. Uh, you see there a very robust staff, technically qualified, but we also have two SDSs to serve as technical experts because we are heavily involved in supporting the intelligence community. And we have seven project managers um, geographically dispersed at three different locations. So what a fine organization. And of course, we are um, supported by three Army Contracting Command locations, as you see there on the right side at Aberdeen Proving Ground, at um, and of course at the Redstone Arsenal and at Fort Belvoir. So I just wanted to kind of um, show perspective where we sit here. Let's go to the next chart, please. So today's panel will discuss challenges and future plans for the Army acquisition modernization. The panelists bring different perspectives and will discuss how they and their teams are closely working together to synergistically support the warfighter. We have an hour and 15 minutes today. You can see what the agenda looks like. Um, I'll take five minutes. I'll introduce our distinguished panel members and give them an opportunity to provide opening remarks. Uh, and then we'll follow, be followed by a, a great uh, Q&A session. What's interesting about these questions is uh, kind of unique. So we went out to um, various folks to ask, hey, what, what do you want to ask these um, distinguished panel members? So we went out to the operational army, um, soldiers, um, company grade officers, uh, asked them what they wanted to know what was going on. We asked uh, acquisition professionals, both military and civilian. Uh, we went to industry and got some industry questions. And then of course we went to congressional uh, professional staff members or PSMs. And many of those folks are in the audience today. They have the link and they've registered to join. Um, so, so we're excited about that. And um, we, we, as, as time allows, if we get through the uh, seven questions that we have, we may be able to accept more questions as you put those in, we'll be watching for those as well. So what, what I'd like to do next is introduce our, our panel members and, and tell you a little bit about our distinguished guests today that have just a remarkable amount of experience, both operationally and in the acquisition community. Um, first, we have Lieutenant General um, Thurgood. He's the Army's Director of Hypersonics, Directed Energy, Space and Rapid Capability, excuse me, Rapid Acquisition Office. Uh, he also served as the Director for Test at the Missile Defense Agency at Redstone Arsenal. Uh, and as the deputy commander for Combined Security Transition Command Afghanistan, also known as CSTICA, United States Army Forces, of course, during Operation Freedom Sentinel. 
We also have our next uh, speaker uh, is General Thomas Todd. He's a Deputy Commanding General for Acquisition and Systems Management, United States Army Futures Command in Austin, Texas. He's also served as a Program Executive Officer for Aviation and Redstone Arsenal, and has uh, also served as a Deputy Commanding General for the United States Army Research Development Engineering Command and Senior Commander at Natick Soldier System Center in Natick, uh, Massachusetts, up near Boston, of course. And our last but perhaps most distinguished speaker is Lieutenant General Michael Williamson, U.S. Army retired. He's the Vice President for the Missiles line of business at Lockheed Martin down in Orlando, Florida, and I know he enjoys it there. Um, he served as a military deputy, the MILDEP as we call it, and the Director for the Army Acquisition Corps, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology in the Pentagon, Washington, D.C. He also served as a Deputy Commanding General for Combined Security Transition Command, Afghanistan, or see stick again during Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, so those are our distinguished panel members. I know they have a lot to offer and I've worked with all of them over the years and, uh, and, and I'm very uh, thankful and honored that they're here with us today. So General Thurgood, the floor is yours for opening comments. So we'll try to limit those to five minutes and we'll go around the horn before we start our questions. Over to you, sir. Sir, I think your uh, microphone is muted. Still muted, sir. So Dr. Morlock, can you hear me? Yes, Mike. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think, I think we, do, uh, uh, his, his phone is showing muted. I think we go to, uh, okay, go to you. General Todd. I agree. So, uh, so we'll um, we'll put General Thurgood on pause for a minute while he fixes that, and uh, so we'll start with um, General Todd. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thanks, Mike. How do you hear me now? Lima Charlie, sir. Okay, great. Uh, from uh, White Sands Missile Range, uh, certainly it's an honor to be with you today, be with all of you, uh, as well as my peers uh, and previous mentors and tormentors. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's 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 certainly a, an honor to represent uh, Army Futures Command as well. Uh, we witnessed today a, a fantastic uh, test experiment, uh, part of our uh, development of uh, future munitions out here at White Sands, and quite frankly, uh, it was a resounding success, which is always good to see. That was the culmination of uh, a good bit of work by a great team all across from uh, the CFTs from Army Futures Command, as well as our PM partners, our developmental labs uh, inside Army Futures Command, as well as industry. So it couldn't be prouder, and it's a great, great day to be talking to you. Uh, it's an honor, first of all, to be asked to be part of this uh, symposium. Certainly uh, acquisition uh, reform, acquisition modernization, as well as modernization across the Army is a hot topic. And no doubt the Army Modernization Enterprise is really the focus of, of, of Army Futures Command. And uh, we seek to do uh, much more than just uh, acquisition reform. I know that the topics that we'll discuss today largely involve acquisition, but what I will say this is there's a committed enterprise from uh, many, many stakeholders across the Army now. Uh, the Army made a concerted effort to essentially put all of us together, uh, ASALT and Army Futures Command, uh, along with industry and uh, any of our other partners throughout DOD that we can depend on uh, to really create outcomes that had never been seen before. We're, we're starting to see the manifestation of that in both traditional uh, partners as well as non-traditional partners. Uh, so as we research, analyze, and engineer ultimately what our uh, the design phase, the search phase, the, de the design phase, and then hand off to our PEO counterparts um, solutions that quite frankly need to be uh, at a certain maturity level. Uh, the Army's poised to make much better decisions going forward. We're poised to make better investment decisions. We're poised to make much better decisions regarding requirements. Uh, we hold requirements open longer now. Uh, much to the frustration of some that would love to see it locked down, 
uh, at a very early point. Uh, but but that was a necessary uh, thing so that we could take advantage of the latest technology in the most rapid fashion. You'll hear from my counterparts today uh, certainly how they do that uh, in their certain sphere of influence. But uh, from my sphere of influence, it it is it is really twofold. It is to integrate uh, science and technology across the science and technology domain, and it's to in integrate science and technology with concepts uh, and ultimately requirements. I do that at Army Futures Command as as uh, really an over overseer and an integrator of our own labs as well as other Army labs. And then, of course, into the DOD. Uh, our goal is to be fully nested with concepts and forward concepts as they're being developed and ultimately help inform uh, solutions along the way as we solve problems. Uh, I think we have a history of perhaps um, claiming to be the patient and going to the doctor and being prescriptive on exactly what we want the doctor to do. Uh, that has to stop. And we're in the process of making sure that that stops, that we rely on the experts in the field, whether it be our own uh, science and technology community, our program managers, our industry partners, you name it. But uh, we're keeping our focus on the problem and allowing the experts to help solve the problem. And I think that's going to produce much, much uh, better outcome, a systems of systems integrated outcome. And we look forward to uh, the discussion today. Again, it's an honor to be here, and on behalf of General Murray and AFC, thanks for uh, the opportunity. Hey, thank you, sir. Great insights from uh, from your perspective there at Army Futures Command. We really appreciate that and look forward to your questions. Uh, I'll now turn, since we have comms with you there, uh, I'll turn to uh, General Williamson. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. Thanks, General Sloan. You, you hear me all right? Roger that, sir. Great. Hey, so first of all, uh, General Sloan, thank you for the invitation. Uh, Dr. Mortlock, um, very exciting panel that you've put together. I, I don't know how you have a conversation about modernization without people like General Todd and, and General Thurgood uh, as part of the panel. So, so it's a real honor for me to be able to be a part of this uh, esteemed group. You know, look, I, I'm... I'm very aware that I wasn't invited because of my time in uniform uh, or my pretty face. Uh, it, it's really to bring the industry perspective. And, and part of the reason why this is a, an exciting conversation is that my last several years, as General Sloan mentioned in the introduction, I've now been uh, with industry well, almost uh, four years. And, and during that time frame, I've had the opportunity to, to watch a lot of great Americans, you know, the starting with the, the people that are in uniform and the, their civilian counterparts, as well as the industry partners. And, and the one thing you're going to hear a lot from me today is about that partnership and, and that relationship going, going forward. I, I'd also hope that I could talk a little bit about risk and how uh, we as a group, as a partnership, look at risk, because that's really what I think uh, helps to set the pace for uh, any modernization effort. And I hope we can spend a little time on that. You know, uh, we talked a little bit about things I did while I was in uniform, but but in this capacity, I'm responsible for uh, our, our, our tactical missiles uh, line of business, We're going from uh, hypersonics uh, to long range precision fires, but also to the close combat, the closer in weapons like a, like a Hellfire. And so uh, a wide range, of, wide range of capabilities. I'm just one of the industry partners that provides those types of capabilities. And I would tell you that, again, as we talk about modernization, understanding the uh, industrial base and our ability to not only find those technologies and those innovative uh, processes and capabilities, but the ability to manufacture those. Do we have the, the talent, the skills, the tooling, the factories uh, in order and the raw materials in order to produce those? A again, all of that gets to how do you pace, pace modernization? And I've been able to observe it. Uh, my first role here in industry was looking across programs uh, throughout uh, Lockheed Martin for the technology aspects, the financial aspects, and then the ability to execute with the right people and schedule 
uh, all the all the wherewithal uh, necessary, and then had the opportunity to look at it from a sense running the sensor business, uh, which gave me another lens into the types of specialized capabilities, tooling, uh, manufacturing needs that are uh, required in order to support modernization. And then finally, um, as as General Todd alluded to. Uh, we had an opportunity this morning to see that partnership in action from the, the government program management team to the uh, industry team, as well as the testers and all of the folks that are required in order for modernization to happen. And so I, I would tell you that that's just a small snapshot because one of the things that I think uh, Dr. Mortlock mentioned and, and General Sloan mentioned is that there are some people in the audience today who represent different aspects of this team sport called acquisition, going all the way to Congress uh, and the committees and the ability to, to not only finance, but the policies that support modernization. Uh, again, that drive the pace of our ability to get capabilities to our war fighters. And so with that, I'll, I'll, I will stop. But uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this is going to be an exciting discussion. Hey, sir, thanks. Um, tremendous opening remarks. We really appreciate that. And you bring um, a unique experience, right? Having served all the way up as a three-star general, both in the acquisition community and now with industry for four years. So it's gonna be great. And when we get to any question that talks about risk, we'll pause there and allow that to be teased out a little bit to your point, because I think that it's gonna be an interesting discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, John Thurgood, we got comms with you now, sir. Uh, how do you hear me now, Mike? That's great. It looks like I see an elbow from a gentleman named Ben back there. He's doing some magic back there, it looks like. So, sir, we got you. The floor is yours. He's actually doing a lot of push-ups right now. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. No, it's great to uh, to be part of the panel today. Uh, Mike, thanks. Dr. Mortlock, thanks for, for letting us be part of that. I appreciate NPS hosting this. Uh, we got a long history with NPS and appreciate all they're doing and teaching uh, our officers across all the services. And this is really a great opportunity to share some ideas uh, today. You know, it's an interesting title to this, uh, this panel and this, this particular forum. And, and I think, similar to what we heard earlier, I think the fundamental of informed change is a, is a realization that the future we want is not our past. Uh, and we really have to get our head around that. And sometimes we hold on to our past because it worked a particular way at a particular time with a particular set of resources. And that future may not be how we'll be successful. That past may not be how we're successful in the future. And so I think we have to realize that we, we have to change our behavior if we want to change our future. Um, and I think that's, uh, that ability to adapt is, is the hallmark of what the Army is doing right now in, in many areas. Uh, one of those areas is the, the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, uh, where we're trying to create a behavior and a culture uh, that is not our past. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, it's about a partnership of a, a group of stakeholders. And that stakeholders, as, uh, as Mike talked about, is from our test community, which we, we have embedded in our, in our office. They physically sit with us. Uh, it's about our industry partners who are embedded in our office. We, they sit with us. Uh, it's about creating teams for outcomes and disaggregating teams when they're done. Um, it's about organizing differently as we move forward. And it's, it's about realizing that, that our past has informed us and give us a great legacy, but our behaviors of the past are not our future. And, and we, have to, we have to be able to move forward now uh, with not just risk in, in program management, uh, those, those risks are, are, are we try to manage and know and execute. It's, it's about a, a larger set of risks about trust with our board of directors called Congress, right? Can they trust us to execute these programs with the correct oversight? And how do we do that oversight uh, with them? And how do we give them the insight that they need uh, to make sure that we're building that trust and confidence? In our particular case, you know, I go to, over to Congress every quarter. I allow every OBS and every disbursement on every program, every penny. 100% uh, transparent with Congress. Um, 
And so now they begin to see that trust and, and that relationship uh, that we build with all those stakeholders are important. The Army, the Army has established the Army Modernization Command, the Army Futures Command that, that General Todd is representing today. And, and those 31 plus four signature programs are changing the behavior of the Army, right? They're changing how we do things, how we look at invention and demonstration uh, which is what our, our greatest in T community does, how we look at prototyping, which is what our organization does, and then how we transition all of that to a program of record, uh, realizing that that continuum from all the way from six one dollars to six four and beyond dollars are part of the behavioral change which we need to overcome some of the the legacy behaviors of the past that that maybe not have served us well in this time, uh, and so as we look at the 31 plus four signature modernization programs for the Army and how that unfolds with Congress and our new budget. Uh, those are all important decisions and that relationship and those cultures that we're trying to drive in our Army will drive us to a behavior that will be different than the past. And that behavior and that culture that we need in our organizations uh, will help us move forward in the future. Uh, so I'll just pause there, uh, just kind of an opening introduction that uh, we actually can do this differently. Uh, we can align ourselves organizationally differently and we can produce different outcomes. We still need to be good at the traditional model because there's lots of programs that are in the traditional model, but we have to be good at new models as we develop. And I'll pause there. Thanks, Mike. Yes, sir. Uh Great approach. I think um, different from the other two opening and, of course, um, remarks from the other two generals. But given your position there, I think uh, I think you also see it from a different perspective. I, I think we all, if we had a Venn diagram, right, there's a center part to your point. But then there are different ways to do things that we do need to certainly, um, I guess, challenge ourselves differently. So I, I would just ask that the, the audience out there, some 800 plus, I don't know how many exactly are out there now, um, really pay attention to these senior leaders because they're very experienced um, uh, and, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but um, they've all worked hard. They've all failed to some degree, learn from it and come back and, uh, and turn, uh, turn that into success. So certainly listen to, to these um, uh, wise gentlemen, I call them the wise men, the gray beards, right? And uh, they have the experience that, that you, um, if you get it early in your careers, will, will, will benefit you greatly. Okay, so we're going to enter into the uh, the question and answer session. So we have seven questions, like I said. Um, so each um, each question has between two to three folks that I'll select to uh, answer the questions. Uh, and again, these questions came from, you know, I didn't make these questions up. They, they, I asked different audiences for these questions and the team here with me did. And these are the questions we had. So the first question is for um, General Todd and General Thurgood. I'll read the question to you. Question number one reads, Army Futures Command achieved full operational capability, FOC, in July 2019. Please share your strategic thoughts on how this was accomplished so rapidly in just one year while reducing risk as much as possible. Over to you, General Todd. Okay, uh, well, there's a saying when you're running from a bear and that is, you know, don't be the slowest runner. So, uh, you know, Army Futures Command, I certainly watched it uh, being a PEO uh, as it stood up, went through IOC, and ultimately what they determined uh, before I even got here was FOC. Um, what I will say that I found when I arrived in August uh, was an organization that had aligned itself, uh, had taken two organizations, ARCIC, turned it into Futures and Concept Center, took RDECOM and turned it into DEVCOM, what we now know as DEVCOM, and started to really fuse them together. Uh, much of FOC was dependent on bringing or those organizations together as well as MRDC, TRAC, um, and, and a few other organizations into what was a family that could operate uh, and produce outcomes. In addition, we brought together much of the realigned budget that all came through a night court process and very much a top-down driven process. We have since uh, inculcated that into our culture, that top-down driven process. Uh, you know, many people think that uh, we started from scratch. We didn't, obviously. We brought organizations together that 
that already existed. And we asked them to do better, right? We asked them to ultimately think about the problem sets a little bit harder, uh, have some discrete analysis to a fidelity that we had not had in the past. Uh, and then be prepared to, as, as General Thurgood mentioned, demonstrate some of those capabilities so that Army decision makers can make good decisions. Um, ultimately, we're here today, uh, you know, with one of our top 31 programs, achieving a significant milestone in that, in that developmental test arena. I don't think we would be here so fast without the synergy created amongst industry amongst the government and uh, our resourcing, as well as our Army senior leaders and decision makers. So if Army Futures Command does one thing, uh, very much like John Thurgood has a board of directors, he goes to the Army Futures Command has a four star in leadership position, specifically to be able to influence other four stars as well as communicate to Army senior leaders when the de decisions need to be teed up, when they need to be made and how rapid they, they need to be made. So full operational capability, you can take it for what it is. Uh, I was very happy to hit the ground in August and find that the Futures, Army Futures Command was uh, forming. We were no longer storming as a team. And uh, I think the, uh, the future is bright. Uh, we stand to only make ourselves better every day, which is our goal. And uh, as, as we say, winning matters certainly, but winning as a team matters more. So. That's uh, really what right now full operational capability means for Army Futures Command. Uh, we certainly are pleased with some of the results of the analysis that we're doing on a collective system of systems basis through project convergence. And, and we look forward to doing more of that and advising uh, Army senior leaders and uh, making commitments uh, that our stakeholders have great expectations for. Thanks. That's awesome, sir. Thank you very much and um, came across uh, loud and clear and a great message. Uh, General Thurgood, over to you, sir. Hey, thanks, Mike. Uh, I think uh, it's a great question and I think there's some some real nuggets that the Army has put together to make this uh, successful. And I really think it's it's kind of on, on, on five fundamental ideas. Um, so, so one is a, a focused outcome, right? We, we, we have a modernization strategy. It's a focused strategy. We put an organization in place and gave it the resources and the people that General Todd was talking about uh, at this Army senior leader level. And that focus is part of the reason you can move fast, right? A clarity of, of focus. Aligned to that focus of what we want to accomplish of, uh, as an Army is the prioritization of those accomplishments. Uh, which is how we got the 31 plus four signature programs. There are lots of other programs in the Army that have to be accomplished. The Army is focusing the 31 plus four um, on the modernization strategies with the six modernization priorities. Uh, and then that follows, and these, as you realize as I'm talking, they're not really something you probably don't know. Uh, they, you may not put them together this way. The third is the authorities to execute. Uh, th that task which has been given. So in, in the case of our organization, you know, we have both head of contracting agency authorities and we have milestone decision authorities. We can, we can get an assigned mission from a senior leader and move directly and quickly without going outside of our organization for, for other, other uh, people's priorities that may not be uh, particularly aligned. So focus priority and alignment of those authorities. And then I think the real nugget of success is really these last two. The first is culture. It, it's the idea that it, it's okay to have a good idea. It's okay to behave differently. It's okay that something we try might not work, right? The fail fast, fail early construct. And, and going into that, wide, eyes wide open, understanding that if we want to move at pace, people say often you hear the words that operate at the speed of relevance. I would tell you that's only half the sentence. It's operating at the speed of relevance, paced by resourcing. <laughs> you, you, you can only go as fast as the resources we have to execute the, the focus and the priority uh, with the authorities that have been given. And, and so you have to plan, you have to plan and, and execute the risk, but you have to plan for success. 
Because if you don't plan for success, then you create a gap to the future, right? You can't just do a, an intervention and do a demonstration and then throw it over to me to do a prototyping and then throw it over to a PO to do a program of record. Those all have to be linked in a, in a series of synchronized and planned resource uh, organizational uh, priorities and authorities. Uh, and then the last, the last piece, I think, which is really the hallmark of, of the Army modernization effort is we realize that in, in an organizational construct like the AFC or like our organization, the way we started may not actually be right. We may need to ad adjust and adapt our organization in real time. Uh, and sometimes we fail to do that as organizations. We put a we put an organization in place to go. That's the answer. Don't change it. Uh, and and as I sit with General Murray and General Todd uh, and the other senior leaders of the Army, uh, we recognize that it's only the start point, and we have to be flexible in our organizational structures and in our outcomes, uh, realizing that it's okay to move forward not knowing the perfect answer. Kind of earlier to what General Todd said, right? We, we might have been slow early on requirements documents. We were sure we were exactly right. <laughs> we're going into this knowing that we don't know if we're exactly right, but we know we're going the right direction, and we have to ad adapt that as we move forward. I think that's the hallmark of, of getting initial capability and then refining that capability to a full operational capability, if, if that's helpful over. Yes, sir. Great feedback on that one, and I think um, well-rounded response from, from both of you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to move into question number two, and as, uh, as I read this one, this is actually a blended question, and I think you'll quickly figure it out that it came from the operational force who's looking for these capabilities, and it's also uh, maybe somewhere around the, um, the capital region of the United States of America. So, um, so this question is for General Williamson, followed by General Todd, um, and the question reads, how well is the Army postured to achieve the top six modernization priorities? And I'll read them. Uh, long range precision fires, uh, next generation combat vehicle, future vertical lift, army network, air and missile defense, and soldier lethality over the next five years with an FY 2020 allocated budget of $30 billion. Over to you, General Williamson. Yeah, th uh, th thanks, General Sloan. I think I would have preferred for uh, General Todd to answer this <laughs> this first because my position is that the Army is well postured. But but let me let me qualify that by saying you've got to go back to some of the things that General Thurgood just said. And so one of those is, and I'm going to give you I'll give you a kind of a bigger industry. I'll, I'll attempt to speak for some of my competitors, and then I'll I'll talk very specifically within my own with my own portfolio. The, the one thing that I would tell you that I believe the Army has done exceptionally well is that they have identified their priorities and they have remained consistent in those priorities. And look, look there's, I'm always guilty of saying this, it's not rocket science, although in my business it is rocket science. It's not rocket science in that you've identified those priorities and we look to see not only do you say it, but that you support it with a budget, right? And so, so you'll see this scramble happen right after, right after the Army announces that these are our priorities. You'll see a scramble of very smart people ripping up the next budget to see if it's followed through with dollars. And what I would tell you is that the Army has, has done that. And so, you know, your question talks about over the next five years. What I can tell you today is that our lens, the lens that we look for, and I do it specifically in the precision fires domain, is, is the Army leadership. And that is not, not just in the national capital region, uh, General Sloan, but at the CFTs, uh, at, the, at, at the operational level, is everyone on board and are they all talking to those priorities? Again, I go back to my opening comment, and that is we're, we're seeing this. We're, we're seeing consistency throughout the force as to what the priorities are, and we're seeing the efforts uh, of the individuals in support uh, of those priorities. And so for us, we, we want to make sure that we stay connected with not just the, uh, the individual item, but but you know, this notion of, of growth and agility 
uh, that uh, General Thurgood referenced and General Todd talked about in his opening comment is, what's our ability to be agile enough in order to support the, um, the flex associated with those priority programs? Uh, I'll, I'll pause and turn it over to General Todd. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, General Williamson. Um, I I'll harken back to 2015. Uh, General Williamson asked me to go down and work with General McMaster's at ARCIC. Um, and, and the big debate was, what's the next big five? If you'll think back to history. Uh, and that's where really the six top priorities have their genesis. Now we know that we couldn't depend on five systems, right? The, the, the nature of war is much more complex um, today than it is than it was when we had the uh, the big five come out of the 70s into the 80s. Uh, so, you know, much of what I would say about the top 31 plus four, ergo the top 58, and even beyond that, programs that are quote, supporting to those top 31 plus four efforts. Um, the Army is postured now better than ever before. The real question is, what do we do with it? Um, and, I, and I would say we have a mandate to succeed. Uh, there are expectations that have been created here. Not often do you have an entire Army reorganized itself. And Army Futures Command, a whole new Army command out of that is a testimony to the commitment to modernize not just technology and material, but to modernize training, to modernize doctrine, to modernize organizations, to modernize facilities. And so are we postured? Yes, better than ever before. I have, in my career, only wished I would have had this kind of focus out of my counterparts. For many years, I was handed a requirement and then they said, best of luck, see you at OT. Uh, and that was pretty depressing. Right. So why did PMs become the trail boss? Because we had to drag it through. We had to integrate the entire army. Uh, and quite frankly, it was never our job to integrate all of the army. It was our job to be the trail boss for sure. And uh, we rightly do do that uh, still today. But what Army Futures Command uh, has done is integrate an entire enterprise. Uh, and with our partners in ASOL um, and elsewhere, uh, will we have to make tough decisions given uh, the budget, which is mentioned in this question? Absolutely. You can expect budgets to remain fixed, if not uh, slightly decreased. But I'm not sure that's a bad thing, all right? Because this old uh, idea of snapping the chalk line you know, eight years out from delivery and never adjusting, never being agile, never never making good decisions along the way as we learn new information uh, is probably a sin of the past. And we can't afford to create that over and over. We can't afford to repeat it. So I, I look forward to the fidelity that comes out of the work through test events, through demonstrations, through experiments, both at the system level and the operational level. And uh, I do think that uh, we have a chance to make use of the budget that we have already and, uh, and produce the outcome that's expected out of the 31 plus four. Mis don't mistake, I don't mean to say that everything will always survive. That's definitely not what you should take away from this. But it's a focus that gives all 31 plus four systems a real chance at survival now and a chance at reaching an outcome and a capability into the hands of our soldiers uh, in a relatively urgent and near fashion vice, a serial process that took years and years and years of the past. So uh, I hope that helps. I hope it sheds some light kind of on what we think inside AFC uh, and how we're trying to integrate uh, and create success. Thanks. Yes, sir. Great, great response. I think, um, I think uh, the team collective, right? Team Army is on the right path, making great progress. We're all seeing that. I know folks are asking the question, you know, soldiers want to, you know, it's credibility with the soldiers. It's also credibility on the Hill and across the entire community. And I think, I think as we continue on this path, I think, um, you know, the, the entire uh, external community will see that. So, um, 
and, and again, it's a unity of effort, unity of command. Is, is, is we're all working toward that same goal. I think we're going to achieve what you said. Uh, thank you, sir, um, very much. All right, so we're going to move to the next question on question number three. Um, question number three is for Lieutenant General Thurgood and Lieutenant General Todd. And so the question reads, given that we have congressional principal staff members, PSMs, in our audience today, can you discuss your role in Army Modernization Enterprise, how you define its success, and how you expect Congress defines its success? So over to you, General Thurgood. All right. Hey, thanks, Mike. Uh, and I, and I hope uh, I hope there are some great some of our great PSMs uh, in the audience. Uh, and I, I spend a lot of time with them. Uh, as a matter of fact, in about another hour and a half, I'll be over on the hill <laughs> uh, with some of them. It, it is uh, we have to understand in the Army that uh, that our grand board of directors called Congress. Uh, gets a vote and and how we execute and what we execute and the resources that we're provided. We we make recommendations from the services up through the Department of Defense. Uh, of course, that'll come out in the president's budget and and then they'll make the final decision of of what what those outcomes might be and then we'll adjust to those outcomes. I, I think what Congress expects of us and and by that extension of our PSMs is re really. Uh, some fundamental principles. Number one, they're giving us resources for an outcome. So they're expecting that outcome, realizing that that some of those outcomes may not work. Some of them may work, but not have great combat utility, and some may be everything we wanted to do and have great combat utility. Um, and so my experience with our PSMs is they they understand that and they realize that. Uh, so I think that's the first thing is to understand is that they're expecting an outcome uh, uh, from those resources. Uh, and that outcome is focused on our military being able to meet its national defense strategy commitments um, as we as we move forward. And that translates all the way down to, you know, boots and all the way up to long range hypersonic weapons. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any doubt that with the resources that we're provided, number one, they ex they expect an outcome. No, number two, um, they, they also, uh, my interaction with them is they expect us to have a, a perspective that is, is where the task we've been given fits into the outcome at the national defense level. How, how does the thing that we've been asked to do on the material side or the requirement side or, or the operational side fit into the national defense strategy that they're resourcing? Uh, and so they want to see the connective tissue that the value of the dollar they've given to us has an output that's related to the national defense of this nation. Uh, and and uh, when you can draw that connectivity uh, correctly and, there, and you have the correct mission that makes that connection simple, then you get a positive, a positive outcome. And, and then the third thing I would say is uh, Congress, uh, the PSMs expect transparency. Uh, and and to be right up front with them and and I and I mentioned earlier that I go over to Congress every quarter, talk to all the PSMs, and I literally show them my budget documents. <laughs> here here are my offset disbursements on every PE. Here's how my spend plan goes. Here's what is on track. Here's what what's off track. And and what I found uh, through that experience, and I've not and and I've not always done that in the past in other positions, but when you want to move fast and you're and you go to the Congress and need their help and in our case as we support the 31 plus 4 modernization uh, signature programs those missions all came in the year of execution I, I didn't have three years to go plan a prom a palm process I didn't, none of that was available to me I literally got the mission for example mid-range capability on the first of July of 20 I have to deliver that capability in 23 and so when you have a blank piece of paper and no money, you have to go to Congress and go, here's what we've been asked to do. Here's what the Army modernization plan is. Here's how this fits into the Army modernization plan. Here's how that modernization plan fits, in, fits into the national defense strategy. And here's the money I need right now in order to make that happen. <laughs> and so I've found that the transparency is, is key. And, and sometimes we have pretty good discussions. Right. Sometimes they're like, well, that that might be 
you might need to adjust that. It might be too high risk, or it might be you can accelerate this. You're not moving fast enough. And so I found that the PSMs are part of the team. They're part of the stakeholders that, that, that Mike Williamson talked about earlier, right? They're not this group of people sitting across the river that you can't go talk to and, and exchange ideas with. That's not been my experience in this job. Um, and so I think, I think we have to, again, change our behavior if we want a different outcome uh, and as we move forward. And I think the relationship between how we interact with our PSMs and how industry interacts with our PMs has to be the similar. It has to be on the similar same message. Um, and, and when we do that, I think it creates a synergistic effect that it is aligned. And, and when you're transparent about it, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, I think that builds credibility for the Army's plan and the, and the modernization strategies of our Army. So I'll, I'll pause there. I hope that's helpful. Over. Yes, sir. Great, great comments on um, open, uh, regular, and honest communication with, with our PSMs. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with you, and I think everyone else would too. So thanks for that. General Todd, over to you, sir. I think General Thurgood left you about 30 seconds for that question. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I'll, uh, you know, I, I'll just, I'll just say this about it's the first part of the question was my role in AME. I'm very much a uh, as Joe Murray's deputy asked to really be down and in. Um, now I have an up and in role and an up and out role, right? So uh, part of that is dealing with industry, uh, but largely the number one task I was given inside this business was integrate, Thomas, integrate, integrate. And that's, you know, a, a hard word to get your hand, hands around uh, because what is integration? Well. Uh, in, in the words of my boss, let's make sure we uh, actually integrate concepts, requirements, technology development, and then ultimately the future programs. So what, what I do is work day to day with those communities. Um, how we define success is, is really, uh, you know, are we thoughtful enough in our initial considerations of ideas and then persistent enough in the refinement of those ideas and technologies uh, that we make sense that we've considered all the factors we can consider in the system of systems approach. Um, and ultimately that brings credibility uh, as our message doesn't change every year, right? One of the things I think we admit is that we're guilty of, and I know uh, Congress has seen is that we kind of change. We, we shift on a dime, but we don't have that persistent focus uh, from the Army senior leadership on down. What, what hopefully I'll be able to do uh, from my position is bring some of the analysis annually so that we can make those refinements, but so also we understand and have good data that supports that we made good decisions along the way thus far and we need to continue. So, uh, in other words, it gives us a foundation. So I look forward to integrating. I look forward to certainly continuing to message that uh, to, to all participants, our stakeholders, our investors in Congress, those that have uh, certainly a concern of what we're doing. Uh, but hopefully, if nothing more, they'll hear, hear a consistent message of integration and refinement along the way. Thanks. Hey, thanks, sir. Great, great message. And I think that's um, probably applicable across the entire enterprise and within the uh, the PEO ranks as well. So thank you very much. We can move to question number four, and, and this question addresses risk. Um, so um, so I'll, I'll say this and, and I'll kind of emphasize it. So with the Army embracing risk and encouraging the acquisition and development communities to fail fast, fail early, how are Army Futures Command, ASALT, industry, individually and collectively managing risk effectively and partnering to deliver Army solutions that can adapt to the future environments. So this question is for, of course, General, uh, let's go with General Todd first, and then followed by General Williams and get your industry perspective. Over to you, sir. Yeah, I'll just say, uh, and hopefully help, help us catch up here. Uh, this is one of the major centerpieces of our analysis piece. Uh, so research analysis engineering are some core functions of AFC. The analysis piece track was moved directly 
as a direct report to the AFC CG for this very reason. We have DAC inside the inside DevCom, which does essentially what is our system level analysis. We have track that does that puts the operational context on top of that and helps us to look at those systems in operational operational environment, both in modeling sim and in real time environments. Um, I, I would say that that analysis allows us to have great, great discussions with industry and with ASOL. So I hope it provides a much more refined product and I hope it uh, consistently is refined along the way as we learn information from test demos, uh, all kinds of knowledge points along the way. But uh, that, that's how I would say, um, you know, we are partnering uh, first and foremost is from an analysis and from a foundational basis of having good analysis up front. Over to you, Mike. No, that's a, so that's a really good point. And, and I'd like to pick up on that because that, that analysis piece is so critical into this, this discussion about risk. And, and General Todd made a couple of points that I want to, I, I want to foot stomp. And it's, that, that analysis is both the technical, so even down to uh, subsystems and components, as well as the overarching system. And then he also talked about the operational uh, uh, analysis and making sure that both of those happen. So, so why why spend all the time talking about this analysis when your question was really specific to risk? Be, be, because it really does charter the things that we're going to invest time in as you try to get to that ultimate that ultimate solution. And what I've discovered over the last couple of years, and, and this is a trend that I think absolutely has to happen. And, and I would offer uh, General Sloan and Dr. Mortlock this this topic by itself. I think would be valuable for bringing industry and government together because I think there are some uh, lessons being learned uh, as we go through uh, these modernization efforts. There are things where we are uh, failing at uh, and there, uh, there should be more discussion and documentation. So let me, let me just take, uh, take a second. And so, you know, I, I look at uh, something that General Thurgood said about the timeline given from the idea, the concept, to when something has to go down range or something has to be delivered. The only way for us to be able to uh, operate in those compressed time cycles is to have confidence in the modeling and the analysis that's done that allows us to focus our, our efforts. I, I can only speak specifically about uh, some of the things in my portfolio, but I would argue that you would get uh, similar comments from my uh, competitors and, and peers out there in industry. And that is, how, how do you do that analysis up front? How do we validate the models that we're using in that analysis? And then how do we make decisions as partners in terms of where we're going to take risk? And, and my emphasis on partners is not accidental. So this can't be where um, one side transfers all of the risk to, to, to the other side. So as, a, as an industry partner, I can't say, look, you know, it's not my problem. You know, this range doesn't do X. You don't have uh, this data collection. We have to sit down at the table together and understand again where those objectives are and then how we're going to get them. And so I have found in the last couple of years I am spending as much time talking to the labs and to the analyst as I am talking directly to program managers uh, and the, the program leadership within the PEO. That, that is a difference for me uh, that I'm seeing and that my team is seeing is that we're now starting to see the collective team look at objectives and how to mitigate risk. In terms of lessons learned, if this is not something that we focus on, if we don't focus on understanding the analysis, agreeing on the analysis, and then agreeing on how we're going to mitigate some of those risks going forward, I don't think we can modernize, modernize at the pace and the rate that General Todd and General Thurgood talked about. Thank you, 
Hey, great, great answer, sir. And I think, as you said, risk is huge, right? And the industry looks at it a little bit differently from, from the, um, you know, the Army Modernization Enterprise. Everything's measured in dollars in, in industry. And so we, we try to do that in, in um, DOD, but it's just different. So let me, let me, um, uh, let me, um, this interesting question came from the audience. And so I'm just going to throw it out there because I think it goes to risk. And it goes to uh, General Williamson, what you just said. And, and this came from a, a, a Mr. A Mann. And it says this. He actually said for, for General Williamson, now that you've been in the industry for several years, how important is it to the Department of Defense acquisition workforce, so putting on your DACM hat here, um, to gain a small margin of industry business acumen from the industry perspective of partnerships, business, how they do business, um, negotiations, captures, proposals, et cetera. Over to you, sir. Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a great question. I think the short answer is that um, look, when when you and I go to negotiate for a car or when we walk into to, to Best Buy to to buy a new TV, uh, we do some research, right? So so we'll we'll go and find out what characteristics uh, uh, are best and what the price should be for those. Uh, I, I think we have a requirement going back to to General Thurgood's comment about. Uh, about his board of directors, at, at the end of the day, and, and look, I'm whether I'm wearing an industry hat or go back to when I was wearing a uniform, uh, I was a taxpayer, and so getting value for for whatever we're doing should should be at the very top of our list. But right up there is delivering a capability to a warfighter, and and uh, General Sloan, I'll push back just a little on a on a comment, and that is, you you, you know. Uh, I, I work with thousands of great Americans, right? They're not wearing a uniform, but they don't come to work each day thinking about a dollar. That, that, that I'm, I tell people this story, I, I hate to burden everyone with this, but as I looked at what I was going to do when I retired, uh, I had an opportunity to tour, uh, tour one of the facilities at Lockheed Martin and something, something was kind of nagging at me and then I realized that there were posters spread around the building. And on these posters were people that work there, but in each, and there was an insert in each one of those of someone who was serving in uniform that was related to them. This is really about, so how do you deliver capabilities to warfighters and the team that does that? Some of the team were, were uniforms, some of the team uh, don't, but they're all committed to to providing that capability. And so, so a long answer to a short question, but but the bottom line is is that I'm not going buy a car without doing research. I'm not going buy uh, or the food that I put on my table. My expectation is that the person that I'm sitting across from the table has also done that research. They understand my capabilities. They understand my limitations, and they're going to hold me to that task that they've asked me to do. And so uh, I, I'm a strong believer that we need to make sure that our workforce, whether it's on the industry side or whether it's on the uniformed or civilian side of the government, have the tools, the education, and the training in order to bring the best capability to our warfighters. Yes, sir. Thanks. And I think we have some good programs in place right now, training with industry and et cetera, right, that um, that we can continue to exploit and get the most out of those programs to make sure that we have strong partnerships across um, industry and, and, of course, DOD to make sure that we understand each other and have great relationships. Thank you very much, sir. I'm going to move to uh, question number five. Um, um, I thought that was important that we, we had that um, question inserted because it came came right on the screen and I thought that was appropriate. What I'd like to do is limit question five to um, General Todd uh, and then General Williamson. And, and um, General Thurgood's nothing personal. Um, you know, uh, if we have time on the back end, I'll give you some more time. <laughs> so, but um, but we, we, we are trying to target um, 1,200 hours here, our time, Eastern Standard Time. So question number five for General Todd, then General Williamson reads, Recently, there's been increased scrutiny by Congress and OSD on the use of flexible acquisition tools like 
other transaction authorities or OTAs as we all call them. With the acquisition community still learning its way through the adaptive acquisition framework and its six pathways, new to many, uh, how would you propose industry and government work together to ensure rapid acquisition approaches are meeting user needs while also following necessary policies and statutes? So, uh, so we'll start with General Todd, sir. Yeah, uh, for the sake of time, I'll be brief. Um, you know, use the authorities we have, right? Um, we don't, we kind of educate ourselves and it's like a doctor that went to med school 20 years ago. We don't really update ourselves. Uh, it's very important that we always uh, in, in the acquisition business, and I say this uh, in my current role as well to the s and community, understand the authorities uh, that we do have because uh, we can go fast, we can be agile, uh, we can make good decisions uh, and we can have rapid where appropriate. Um, rapid's not always appropriate to be clear. Uh, sometimes we need a very high level of confidence in the system. And that doesn't necessarily mean rapid, that means a high level of surety. Uh, I will use nuclear triad as an example. Uh, there are certain things that we cannot afford with aviation to go wrong. We don't want aircraft to break after they break ground. Uh, that's a bad day for those on board. So rapid has its place. Uh, we have the authorities to do it. The one thing I would say is I didn't make enough use uh, in my lifetime uh, of really what could be done in advance of handing somebody handing me a program. Uh, so much to General Williamson's point and to much, much to what General Thurgood is doing right now in prototyping, uh, we really need to take advantage of those authorities as well. Uh, I think that will burn down quite a bit of risk and uh, we'll end up with uh, much more efficient ergo rapid uh, buildings uh, in the future. Thanks. Because I don't, I don't really have a lot to, to add to General Todd's comments. So, so you know, my, my shorter version would be it's the right tool at the right time. And, and my concern uh, from an industry perspective um, is you know, with the use of OTAs, um, don't use that just for speed. There are appropriate places to use an OTA, and I think you'll find industry being very, very responsive. Uh, along with General Todd's comment, it, you know, when you look at look at what you're trying to achieve and what's the right tool, uh, and I, I think you'll find industry being very receptive to supporting uh, the right use of use of tools. Um, my my uh, my only other foot stump here goes back to to risk is that again if you look at your program objectives you look at your timing uh, you look at your funding and all of those attributes and then come up with the right strategy to include the right contracting strategy that you're going to implement uh, I'm I'm just concerned now that um, OTAs are the tool du, du jour and and so it's being probably there are probably cases where it may not be the most effective. Yes, sir. Thanks. And I think um, as, as we see here working together, right, industry working with um, uh, directly with the government and helping us select the right tool and vice versa, right? We talking to you to figure out which tools are the best tools to accomplish uh, collective success. So uh, that was, that was my fifth question. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to my last question. Um, yeah, and I think what, what I'd like to do is um, we have six minutes and I'll ask the question then if, if I could get an answer from um, General Thurgood and then General Todd and then um, close out with General Williamson. Uh, and and um, so, so we talk about Army modernization, right? And, um, but we also talk about rapid acquisition, but we also have this thing called MDO, multi-domain operations, right? Where we're supposed to be and how we want to get there by 2028. Um, and, and as we all know, um, MDO is, um, you know, we start talking about joint fight, right? And so, and we also don't ever usually fight large conflicts, wars uh, without uh, our international partners. So let me read the question. And um, it, uh, our modernization and rapid acquisition unintentionally creating challenges for joint force interoperability, you know, are we getting ahead? Are we not remaining synchronized with our joint forces and international partners? Um, so creating challenges for joint force interoperability in support of multi-domain operations. So uh, we'll start with General Thurgood, then General Todd, then General Williamson. Over to you, sir. All right, hey, thanks, Mike. 
I, I would just tell you at the the heart of multi domain operations is interconnectivity and inter interoperations. It, it the the purpose of multi domain op operations and the recognition that you can't do it alone is is exactly in my opinion opposite of that question. It, it's not taking us faster or on a different trail. It's providing equipment that must interoperate in a multi domain fight realizing that we rely on our sister services, rely on our other branches in the military, uh, inside the Army as well. So I think the heart of multiple domain operations is interconnectivity. It, it's not about going fast on a single widget. It's about going fast on a single widget that fits in the fight of the, of the multiple domain. Over. Hey, thank you, sir. Uh, great points. So over to you, General Todd, sir. Yeah, I have two thoughts. Uh regarding that first of all is the joint piece uh as we put some meat on the bones of multi-domain ops and doctrine i.e modernizing doctrine uh we must uh, understand that it, it is a joint fight at all times uh, the beauty of project convergence i'll take just a second to to promote project convergence is it, it has evolved into a joint event uh, it has a board of directors that has representation from the joint staff, uh, the J7 and the J3, as well as the J6, and uh, all services are participating. Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps are all there with joint uh, mission threads as dictated um, by the what will be the joint operating concept. Uh, so the Army uh, warfighting concept uh, is fully nested in that. So we will, I think, flush out quite a bit as we bring in technology and integrate it into the force operationally. Uh, the number one concern that I have is very similar to General Thurgood's thoughts on uh, interconnectivity. Uh, and uh, PEO C3T, uh, Rob Collins is, is embedded in that, I would say, project convergence event, so much that he has named a, a product director for configuration management of the network in particular in project convergence because there's so many changes being made. As you can imagine the whole ATO process drives us, uh, first of all, crazy. And second, it makes it very linear, right? And time consuming. Uh, so I look forward to seeing what we learn out of each year. Certainly Michael has a lot to say regarding that. Uh, I hope that we can do change management well, configuration management well and track changes as well as uh, ensure interoperability with both our joint partners and in the future coalition partners. So, hope you might. Yeah, just, just real quickly, just, just two ads. Uh, you know, General Thurgood hit it and General Todd said it. So, so from an industry perspective, and uh, I can speak to this because I actually have the lead within, within my organization for project convergence, but, but there's one point that was made and that is, so you can't approach this from a single thread. We start, now with understanding that you have to have that interoperability and that ability to communicate uh, from the beginning. What I would argue, and we could talk about it, is in many cases, we built that single thread first and then tried to figure out afterwards how to make it connect and how to make it interoperable. That's wrong. That's, that's, that's our starting point now as an organization is, how do we make sure that we are interoperable not with just the army, but with the with the other services. And unless that mindset is the one that's employed, I don't think we'll ever get there. Hey, thanks, sir. I, I think um, sounds to me like we're nested. Great, great points on uh, project convergence and the, the various ones throughout the year. So to, to the audience, if you haven't seen what we're doing through project convergence, please go out there, take a look at it. Unclassified, you can see where, where interoperability is taking place. So that's awesome. So uh, yeah, so so generals, thank you for your tremendous insights today. Uh, it's always great to, to speak to you, even even this way, or even better in person when I have the opportunity to be around you. I learned so much from you. And spending time today with the entire audience, um, your feedback is gonna assist us uh, and our participants in better understanding the challenges and help us continue to forge a path ahead for a safe nation as, as we move forward with this new Army modernization enterprise. So, so that wraps up our session. Uh, I, I ask the audience to please uh, check the symposium program for a link to your next scheduled event. I thank you and, and generals, thank you so much. It's great to see you. Thank you, Dr. Mortlock for the opportunity and I'll hand it back over to you. Fantastic discussion. Thank you, General Sloan for hosting these three distinguished leaders. 
Uh, most beneficial and the attendees got a lot out of it. Enjoy the rest of the